Minnesota. I had to uh, talk my wife into this one. She didn't understand why I was going to Minnesota, but I'm happy to be here. I was asked from, with my friends to come out and share with you what we're doing out in crazy California, and I hope today you get a little bit out of it, um, because certainly we have. So thank you, Hammers. Now, I don't know if you're a TV fan. I am. I don't know if you remember Seinfeld, of course. It's one of the greatest shows of all time in my mind. Uh, but in particular, they had one episode that they described their show about nothing. All right? And they're pitching. George and Jerry are on the couch. They're at the NBC president's uh, office in New York. And they're pitching their idea of, of this concept of, hey, we have an idea for a show, and it's about nothing. And the NBC president is lost, saying, what do you mean it's about nothing? Well. It's about what you did today. What'd you do today? Oh, I got up, I, I, I got coffee, and I came to work. That's a show. And it's funny, but it was unique. It was bold. It was different. And somehow, America got it, right? And essentially, that's what we're doing in our wealth management practice today, is we're, we're doing nothing. And it's led us to great success. Um, what I mean by that is nothing is actually everything, right? Nothing is life. Nothing is, 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 well, when you look at nothing from a, a unique perspective, it can be engaging and entertaining. And that's why it led Seinfeld to be one of the best shows of all time. The next 45, 50 minutes that we have together, I want to, I want to, I want to encourage you to interrupt me, stop me. It's a workshop. It's not a, it's not a presentation. Okay. This is time to work on your practice versus in your practice. Again, that's the important thing today, on your practice. When Aaron asked me to speak today and come out to see you, he asked me to do one thing, if I could, and that was to compel you to think differently. So how many in this room, by show of hands, are doing some sort of marketing campaign? Just about everybody, right? And is it true to say that we're always marketing? I mean, isn't the financial management side of it or the policy management side really a minority part of the business? We're always searching for that next big thing, swimming like sharks. Once you stop swimming, you, you're done. Um, but I do actually owe you one, one apology because I kind of tricked you to get you in the room today. You see, when we gave the, the materials, I guess, to to NAFA, we said, yeah, we just want to tell you about our successful marketing campaign. But here's the truth. Marketing campaign, these are terrible words. I want you to remove them from your vocabulary. I'm going to read you the definition of marketing. The definition of marketing is the total of activities involved in the transfer of goods from the producer or seller to the consumer or buyer. Right? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be doing that. So you might say that marketing is you're trying to convince or maybe even fake somebody into buying something from you. Campaign. We hear a lot about campaigns right now in the political world, but campaign by definition is what? It's an isolated period of time. There's a beginning and an end to a campaign when we just noted that our endeavors are perpetual. So let's get rid of those words. What we like to do is we like to call it the experience. What is my client's experience on doing business with me? What is their experience when interacting with our office? It's definitely not marketing. Okay, before I get to my second point, I want to ask a couple more questions. By show of hands, how many in this room are good financial planners? Only half? I'd imagine everyone is, or they wouldn't simply be in this room, right? Um, how many of you have, you know, on your business card, your credentials behind your names, or you, you reference your expertise maybe in your uh, uh, initial presentation? Okay, great. However, this gets to my second point. My second point is, I need to tell you something. It's not about you. It never was. It's about them. Okay, now, don't get me wrong, we all do it, I do it. You, you, you sit in the office, you have that 
first meeting and they're sitting across from you and you have that kind of, you need me swagger to it, you know, like, what can I do for you? You know, how can I help you? You need me. But that's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. You know, we spend that entire meeting convincing these people that they need us. But do they really need us? Or they do. Do we need to convince them of that? They're sitting in front of you. Don't they already know they need you? Or they wouldn't be there in the first place, right? So there's a distinct difference in my mind of leading and, and, and kind of embellishing your confidence versus just having it. Okay, you need the swagger, but take a back burner. Now, here's the why, in my opinion, the, the term trusted advisor has become so popular today. Think about the trusted advisors in your life. Who are they? Physicians, accountants, attorneys, friends, family? Let's think about your doctor for a second. How much does your doctor know about you? A ton. How much do you know about them? Very little. When they're asking you, where does it hurt and why are you here to see me today? You're not asking them about how they did in medical school, about their degrees or, or you know, perhaps some of their undergrad work, right? No. And then let's think a little further. How'd you meet this doctor? Did you Google him? Probably not. What'd you do? You reached out to your friends. Maybe they're actually real friends that have, you know, uh, a pulse and they're not social friends or maybe you did reach out on social media and say hey I'm having a problem with this or that can you recommend a good doctor well let's let's transition let's think about your accountant now they know about as much about you as a physician equally personal information right how much do you know about him or her very little so the sooner you can get in your mind that it's not about you it's about them the sooner, in my opinion, you can free up your thinking and grow your practice. You see, to be a great financial planner, you really need to know more about them. If there's a 30-minute meeting, 28 minutes should be spent learning about them and two on you. By the way, they already know a lot about you. If they want to know more, they're going to go to your website. If they really want to know about you, they're going to go check you out on FINRA's broker check. People think about themselves. They want to talk about themselves. And in talking about themselves, they're sharing. And they feel connected with you. They don't feel connected with you by hearing about you. They feel connected with you by telling about themselves. So here's what I tell you. Shut up, listen, and make that first meeting enjoyable. And just frankly, awesome. You see, people do business with people they like, right? Better yet, love, ultimately that they trust. So what is our job? Our job is to make people love us, right? And once they love us, what's our number one B, not number two job, is to then make them be able to trust you. Now, Therefore, segueing into how I approach this, I believe our most important job is to create experiences that enable us to connect with people on a deeper level, where they can like us, potentially love us, and trust us. Don't sell yourself, and definitely don't sell products. Okay, now that sounds counterintuitive, especially in the room, and I apologize to the sponsors. But here's what I firmly believe. If you genuinely listen to your client, if you genuinely, or prospect, and you genuinely, genuinely do what's in their best interest, then when the time is right, you're genuinely going to do some planning for you, and everything that you wanted will come as a byproduct. You see, being a good financial advisor is caring and putting your client first. Ironically, being a good financial advisor is ultimately just expected, again, or they wouldn't be in front of you. How many of you in this room have heard of Don Connolly? Okay, if you haven't, Google him. Um, he's a great guy. We just had him actually come out and speak in Bakersfield to my clients. But aside from that, he, uh, I was at an MDRT meeting some time ago and 
he gave a great talk. And I'm just going to say how, or, or give you a little insight of how he started his presentation. He started his presentation with something like this. He tells a story about how he dropped his car off at the, at the car lot and, um, uh, to get serviced. And what did he do? So he pulls up. He has his appointment. He's right on time. The kid comes out, you know, puts a little plastic deal on his seat, puts a little floor mat in. Good morning, Mr. Connolly. How are you today? We have you on the schedule. Let me take your car back. I'm going to give you a ride to work. And so they do. He does. He ends up at work. They call him later in the day. Okay, sir. We did a 14 point inspection. Your car is all clear. You know, we're going to come pick you up, take you back to your car. He does. They do. He ends up at his car. The car's washed, waxed, perfect. He has the paperwork in the dashboard. Boom, he's on his way. Really a perfect experience. About two weeks later, he gets a little survey in the mail. Survey on the front says, how'd we do? And wants him to comment and rank the, 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 if you would, the staff. What do you think he put? One through ten. That's what most people would say, right? He didn't. Why not? They were doing their job. How, how bad has our society gotten now when somebody just simply does their job, then we give them a 10? So again, being a good financial planner in my mind is somewhat expected, okay? So moving on, I like stories. Um, stories are something everybody can relate to, not charts and graphs and figures and credentials. It's, it's, it's about stories. It's, it's kind of why the Eagles maybe and the Beatles have had such timeless music because they all tell stories that we can relate to. So as I tell you some of the things that I'm doing today, I want you to think of this with a selfish, not selfless, selfish filter on. I'm going to share with you exactly what I'm doing. I'm not going to hold back, but that doesn't mean what I'm doing is what you need to be doing. So here's what I want you to do. Take what I'm doing and morph it, edit it, drop it, embellish it to make it your voice, take it to your practice, or potentially it inspires you to, to um, um, create your own ideas that are unique. And if you do, I'd really love it if you get them back to me because I'm always looking for new ideas. So to transition, I want to show you a little bit of video here. You don't mind? Speaking of having it all. Where were you? I went to the beach. Oh, the beach! It's not working, Jerry. It's just not working. What is it that isn't working? Why did it all turn out like this for me? I had so much promise. <laughs> I was personable. I was bright. Oh, maybe not academically speaking, but I was perceptive. I always know when someone's uncomfortable at a party. Hey. Can I come over? It all became very clear to me sitting out there today that every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. <laughs> my life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. Every instinct I have in every aspect of life, be it something to wear, something to eat, it's often wrong. <laughs> Tuna, toast, coleslaw, cup of coffee. Yeah. No, 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 wait a minute. I always have tuna on toast. Nothing's ever worked out for me with tuna on toast. I want the complete opposite of tuna on toast. Chicken salad on rye, untoasted, with a side of potato salad, and a cup of tea. <laughs> well, there's no telling what can happen from this. You know, chicken salad's not the opposite of tuna. Salmon's the opposite of tuna, because salmon swim against the current, and the tuna swim with it. Good for the tuna. Uh, George, you know that woman just looked at you. So what? What am I supposed to do? Go talk to her. Elaine, bald men with no jobs and no money who live with their parents <laughs> don't approach strange women. Well, here's your chance to try the opposite. Instead of tuna salad and being intimidated by women, chicken salad and going right up to them. Yeah. I should do the opposite. I should. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. Yes. I will do the opposite. 
I used to sit here and do nothing and regret it for the rest of the day. So now I will do the opposite and I will do something. Excuse me, uh, I couldn't help but notice that you were looking in my direction. <laughs> oh, yes, I was. You just ordered the same exact lunch as me. <laughs> my name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. I'm Victoria. Hi. <laughs> So in the spirit of doing something different, I'd like to share some powerful quotes with you. The great Albert Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. As George showed us, and as maybe you're experiencing in your own practice, I think this is relevant today, but I also want to share with you Mr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein's other lesser known gems. We cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking that we use to create them. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think different. Think outside the box, I guess is kind of a, a dated phrase, right? And from this, you typically need outside perspective. You're biased. You need somebody else to tell you and to help you think through this. Anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. I fell on my face so many times with so many events and continue to. I coach baseball, as Mr. Hammer noted, and what we tell our kids, um, or club travel team, is that practice should not look good. Practice should be really ugly. It's where you develop. It's where you're, you're wanting to get better. If you're doing it perfect, then you're doing it wrong, because you should be always pushing yourself to move on and on and on. Everything should be made as simple as possible but not simpler. Anybody in here read Colin Powell's Secrets to Leadership? It's a good book, you should pick it up. It's a little dated too, but in there he references an idea that he calls P equals 40 over 70. What P stands for is the pro probability of success. So what his notion is, the probability of success is only going to work or be at the highest if you have information within the 40 to 70 percent range. If you have less than 40% of the information, then you cannot make a decision because you do not have enough information. However, here's the important part. If you have more than 70% of the information, oftentimes we're stuck in analysis paralysis. We sit there and we don't know which way to go because we're thinking about it too much. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Now, my wife would agree with this statement. I believe everybody in this room is smarter than me. However, my clients want me to be smart, but they want me to use my imagination and my creativity to add value to what they're doing. Strive not to be a success, but rather a value. I love this one because this is really simple, and this goes back to, if you would, my mantra. If you're doing what's right and being genuine, if you're just trying to add value, then success will come naturally. Weakness of attitude becomes weakness of character. Now this is going to sound a little different when I tell you what I'm doing. It's going to be kind of edgy and if you kind of indulge it a little bit, it's going to feel awkward and you're going to fail at times. But I want you to persevere. I want you to keep trying because if you commit to this, as I was talking to Ed earlier, if you commit to this for a period of time, I truly believe you'll see results, much like we have. So enough of all the motivational stuff, let's get down to it. Um, I'll close Einstein's portion today by telling you what I think is E equals MC squared, or theory of relativity actually means. Effort equals more cash squared. You see, in doing this, you're going to have to do a lot of the work. This is why those canned marketing, and I said marketing, approaches don't work. They're not your voice. You are paying somebody else to get out of doing the work. So what did I do? The first thing I did is I, I hired a coach, an executive coach. Um, I like to refer to him as a collaborator. His name is Robert Berman. Again, I met him at an MDRT um, function, and a friend of mine up in Bend, Oregon was using him. 
And he said, you just got to meet this guy. So I do. I call him, and right away I knew there was some synergy between me and him. I'm not suggesting you use Robert, um, but find somebody. Find somebody because here's the most important part of this. You need someone to call you out on your stuff. Because the truth is, like a personal trainer, you will not do this on your own. You might start just like a diet or a personal training regimen, but you're not going to complete it. You'll get tired. You'll get discouraged. It costs too much money. It's too much thinking. I've never done this before. My wife asks me often, she says, I don't understand if you're a wedding planner or a financial planner. <laughs> so with that, if you hire a coach, they're going to keep you accountable. Okay? And if you have somebody in your office to fill that role, so use them. So then what do we do? So I have a coach, a little bit about Robert. We then spent a lot of time. We took a, what I call a deep dive into my business. I wanted to figure out not only who I was, but where we wanted to go to. I wanted to be true to me. I wanted to make sure that whatever I was going to embark on next was a voice that was unique to our practice. This is important. This is big. This is taking the time to work on your practice rather than in your practice. You heard of the term buffer days have, have gotten a lot of popularity now. You need these. Okay? If not, you're going to just get caught up in the, the day in and day out and never grow. So you need to plan tenaciously. And then, once you figure out what your plan is, we go to implement. One sec. You see, why these canned approaches, these turnkey systems don't work is they're, they're again, they're somebody else's voice. You have to understand where I came from. So um, I, I started back in 1998 technically, but, but really practicing, I guess, with licenses in 99, um, not studying. And um, with that, we, we did a lot of seminars. We were really good at it. So we would spend, you know, $50,000 a year on mailers through some sort of mailing company, and they would send it out to, you know, 5,000 different recipients. And we would get 25 people to maybe to respond to come to some boring seminar. 23 of the 25, by the way, were plate lickers, right? And maybe two of those suckers would actually buy something from me. And I did say, buy something from me. I didn't say become a client. Now what I noticed was, we were doing very good numbers, but these were not the way we wanted to grow. These were not the clients I wanted to experience life with. Because as easily as those two people might come over to us, they're gonna leave us just as quickly. And so again, going through the effort, taking the time and not using some canned approach is going to yield the best results. So then I would ask you this. The real question is, in thinking through this, who are you? Can you answer that? Because if you can't answer that, you should be able to. Another important question, and actually the only question, is why should someone do business with you instead of the other guy? Again, why should somebody do business with you instead of the other guy? Guess what? If you can't answer that question, then we're not going to do business with you. So, as they said, I'm big on events. So let's kind of break into exactly what we did. We like to categorize our experiences. So we, we created what we call ex experiential events. We like to categorize them under three different areas. Client appreciation and prospecting. Education health and wellness. Now, some of these might seem a little odd and they're fun. Uh, I live in California. It's a little different out there. If you don't know already. Uh, but anyway, so let me just get into it and I'll just describe these as I go. One of my client uh, appreciation events, we call it skeet, five hours of skeet and meat. As I mentioned, I like to hunt, right? And in liking to hunt, um, the dove opener, which is dove season, is always in September. And right before that, you end up with a lot of guys who haven't shot a gun all summer. And so what we did is we rented a local gun club. And I thought it was kind of funny to take the Woodstock poster of three days of peace and music and morph it 
to five hours of skeet and meat instead of a guitar, put the dove on the shotgun. It's a little sadistic, I get you, but it works. So here's the, here's the idea behind the event. We run a, a gun club for the entire day. We're the only ones out there. We have a barbecue company come out and set up a barbecue. Now, predominantly men are coming out, but we also have a children's instructor and a woman's instructor. So what we're doing is we're providing instruction for those of them who don't know how to shoot or, or want to kind of try it out. And then we're also providing the infrastructure for those who are pretty seasoned hunters or shooters. And so the guy's barbecuing all day and he's giving the, you know, the men barbecuing tips along the way. Interesting part, we have a couple kegs of beer out there. So it's Bakersfield in California, but we're kind of an isolated area. Um, and at the conclusion of that, this last one, we had a local distillery try whiskeys. So when the guns were put away. So there, just an idea. Uh, we had about 100 people come to this. And I would say 70% of our attendees are clients, 30% non-clients. Another idea, golf skills clinic. Now, this one's a little different. So here's what I think about golfing. I like to golf and, you know, I can always woo a client and say, hey, why don't we go play this fancy country club? Well, here's the truth. The truth is my clients, the ones I really want, can play wherever they want, whenever they want. And honestly, the last person they're going to want to play with is somebody like me. They want to play with their own people, right? So how do you break through? What do you do? So we created a skills clinic where we went to a really nice country club. I went to the head pro and I said, hey, I want you to grab two or three other pros. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to invite my clients and ask them to invite their foursomes. And we're going to put them with some pros for three hours. And so what we do is, there's two versions of this. The first version is we take everybody and we put them in three groups. One group is on the driving range. By the way, when I say groups, there's no more than usually 18 people. So six in a group, all right? So we put six people on the driving range with one pro. We put six people on a putting green with another pro. And then we take six people and we put them in this little chipping practice hole area for sand and, and chipping and punching. And what happens is they have a private group lesson with this instructor. And then after about 45 minutes, they rotate. And so through three rotations, they've hit all stations, right? Afterwards, we have a contest where we usually give away, you know, a Cleveland wedge or something. We do a chipping contest. We have hors d'oeuvres and cocktails out there and we just stand and enjoy. Now, at my events, this is key. There's no timeshare pitch. It's about what we're doing. I, don't, I tell them who I am, but that's as far as I go. If they want to talk business, it's actually more powerful to me when you tell them, no, I, I appreciate that. I'd love to set some time with you to talk about your questions, but today's about golf. Today's about shooting. Today's about some of the other things I'm going to share with you. So I would encourage you to not timeshare pitch. I would also encourage you to be consistent with this because your clients, we invite our clients and we invite them to invite their friends. They're not going to trust you the moment that you pull out the swagger on the golf course and start hitting up their friends. So it's, it's kind of like a drip marketing campaign. So back to the golf. So the first version is as I stated, by the way, my collaborator, my coach came up with this idea of having tickets. It sounds really cheesy. It's not like we have a ticket taker, but when you send somebody tickets to an event, they're more inclined to show up and, or they'll call and say, Hey, you sent me these tickets, something came up and can I bring them back to your office? And you're like, that's a stupid piece of paper. No, like, but it, it, it kind of brands them to your events. Okay. So, so the second version, so that's good for a variety of golfers because I don't care how good and how, how prestigious some of these people are. They always want to work on their game and even more so they want to work on it with their friends. And so what do I do at this event? I just run around and drive around in a golf cart and just give them crap like any other golfer would like, ah, you should be here. Look at that swing. That's awful. And we just have fun. So the second version is for, more for the, the, the lower handicap golfers. The second version is doing exactly the first, but instead of having them rotate through th three stations, we actually put them in a foursome or usually a threesome out on the golf course with a pro. And so they have a riding lesson for nine holes because that's something that they never do is a situational lesson and really good golfers like situational lessons where they can go out on the third hole and say, okay, well, here's my ball. Where do I, what would I do with this? And the pro stops, gets out and shows them a few different alternatives. Next wine tastings. 
Wine tastings are, are pretty popular. So we said, well, how can we just go over the top? And so what we did is, uh, we're in the middle of wine country, and so we actually looked, for this wine tasting in particular, we actually looked um, up to Washington, out of California, to show all the wine snobs of California that there's really good wines somewhere else. So we went to Walla Walla, Washington, which actually has more 90 plus rated wines in California and Italy combined. And we flew down eight winemakers, put them up at a hotel, had a big wine tasting at a hundred year old restaurant. And well, we're doing this again in two weeks. I think I have, well, I already sold out. We have 200 people coming. And then the ones we're doing in two weeks, 100 of, my, 100 of those 200 people are clients, 100 aren't. No timeshare pitch. We bring in a charity to recognize the charity. We've set up some cornhole boards in the back. People walk around, listen to some Frank Sinatra, enjoy some wine, get to talk to the winemaker, enjoy incredible food, no pitch. You're going to have people come up to you at these events and say, my guy doesn't even call me. And you're opening $100 bottles of wine for me. Next, our Sushi Academy. I know, California. A friend of mine owns a, a, the best sushi restaurant in town. I agreed uh, to, to fill it out one day. So on a Saturday, he shut it down, private event. We had him go through Japanese culture, six flights of sake, had everybody make their own rolls. And it was so much fun. It was about three hours. Things like this, people don't get to do. And think about this. If your clients are the only ones showing up, you're building rapport and you're deepening your relationship with them. Guess what happens on a Saturday afternoon when they leave there? They're going out Saturday night or Sunday and they're seeing their friends and their friends are saying, what'd you do this weekend? I, I learned how to make sushi. How? Oh, I went to this thing for my financial planner. He has all these different crazy events and he had this sushi chef teach us what to do. And so the indirect marketing, again, it's powerful. And we send them away with a rolling mat and we had chopsticks made. Okay, so we always try to do some creative takeaway. Like on my ski to meat this year, it's funny, it's gonna sound stupid, but it's really cool. We give away buckets. Anybody who hunts knows that dove hunters love buckets because you take your beer and your shells and you sit down, you shoot birds, put the birds in the bucket, the empty cans in the bucket, your shells in the bucket, and you walk back out. And so we had uh, 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 logoed buckets made. A couple of years we did t-shirts, kind of like the college fraternity party, you always get a t-shirt kind of idea. So we always try to do something different. In this one, it was the, uh, the chopsticks. So switching, pivoting a little bit, another one that we've done, and we just did this uh, around Obama's State of the Union address, we call it our town hall. Now, people are inundated with information, right? What happens? So let me tell you about me getting to the airport. I wake up, I, right when I wake up, I check my phone, make my coffee, I get in my car, I listen to XM radio, I'm listening to the markets the whole way down to Los Angeles. Right before I get on an airplane, I typically gas up my car. This particular day, I got out, I put gas in my car. Right when I turned on the pump, there's a TV screen that comes on while I'm pumping gas and it's telling me about the markets. I'm like, really? I know. Then what do I do? I go, I park my car, I get on the shuttle to get into the airport. I check in my phone again, checking the markets, checking whatever. And then what happens? I get in the airport, maybe I grab another cup of coffee and what's above Starbucks? A TV, away from my flight. And then finally they shut the cockpit doors. That's just me. Think about your clients. Think about how many versions of information they get access to a day. It's mind boggling. And actually it disturbs some of my older clients because they don't want the information. And there's so much misinformation, like the DOL stuff that Ed was talking about and he's gonna share with you later. There's so, excuse me, so much bad stuff out there. And so what did we do? We created a town hall event. And here's what I did. You can see here this copy of our invitation. We, we, uh, we had somebody that was an attorney for Obamacare uh, locally for, for companies that, for them to be compliant. We had a mortgage broker. We have a lady who worked at Social Security. We had a, a really, really well-known CPA, an estate planning attorney. We've had detectives that investigate financial crimes locally talk about identity theft. Here's the thing, a room just like this, coffee and tea in the back. We set them up here on a panel. They're at tables such as yourselves. And all I do, there's no agenda, there's no canned presentations. 
I run around with a microphone like Donahue. They ask questions because here's what your clients are doing with the flood of information they're getting. They're trying to decipher it. How does this relate to me? Again, we're all selfish. We want to talk about ourselves, know about ourselves and solve problems for ourselves. And so they read an article on social security and the three changes that just came out and they go, ah, does this, is this something I need to concern myself with about me? They don't want to know for the academic reason of knowing. And so what do we do? We put them on a panel and they get to ask their, or the experts on the panel, they get to ask their questions and I'm now perceived as resourceful. These are my experts. I have access to people like this and 20 more. Just give me a problem. I'm going to answer your questions. They feel wonderful about it. Not everybody's going to ask questions and it will slow down. And so I would advise you to have kind of in your hand and your queue, no known questions to ask the experts when nobody raises their hand, you know, and just have them kind of fill time about estate planning or social security or something. Um, but everybody then starts springboarding these questions where, you know, John might ask a question in regards to interest rates about negative rates. And then that makes somebody else ask a question about HARP, you know, the loan program. And then I mean, goes, I never thought of that. What about this? And it feeds on each other and everybody walks out of there knowing that we're the experts, but I didn't have to say anything. I think the industry has done a very good job highlighting an issue. And what is this issue? Women outlive men. And what happens? Those assets leave that advisor. Right? Why? At some point, women either voluntarily or involuntarily tend to get left behind in the financial planning process. And at some point they want to re-engage, but they almost feel silly asking the questions like, you know, we're, we're setting up three different trusts and now you want to know what a mutual fund is really. And so they just disengage. That doesn't mean they're not thinking about it. They're actually really worried about it. And as happily married as you are, they go to lunch with their friends and their friends are getting divorces and telling how they just got trucked over and aren't getting any money. And meanwhile, we're all bringing information home to them. We're asking them to sign something for an IRS and this and that and the other, and the attorney wants you to do this and they're trusting us. But at the same time, they don't feel confident, right? So what did we do? We created a ladies only event where we had a female CPA, a female estate planning attorney and me who is not a female. Uh, but we, we, uh, we got an art gallery. We have valet parkers. This is important because women don't necessarily want to park their car and walk in the dark, you know, downtown and to get to some sort of gallery. We have the artist usually who's presenting at the gallery there to talk about, you know, uh, in this case it was her, um, her, uh, 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 uh paintings. Um, and what we do is we, we have a wine and candy pairing. Usually sometimes we just do these really interesting pairings. But the idea being that we want to create this cohesive, safe environment where women can ask questions with other women that they wouldn't ask in a room with their husband and their advisor. And they're comfortable. A friend of mine did the same thing. He did it at a spa. And so he had them all in their kind of, I guess their robes and the, you know, ready. He paid for each of them to get a treatment and then they went off you know, at the end of it and we're able to enjoy a massage or a facial or something. But in the meantime, women, when they get together, there's, there's a bond there and they're, they're comfortable. There's no judgment. There's no anything. And what do they do? They walk away knowing their situation. They'll say, what's a trust? If I get divorced, I mean, how do I know that I'm not in trouble? And they can ask these questions or hear the response from somebody else asking and know that they're okay. They're okay. And the fact that you did that for them, is an immediate relationship builder. And by the way, I've gotten feedback from the husbands saying, now what are you doing? And I explain it. And then they, then they, at first they're a little indifferent. They're like, I don't know if I want my wife to go to that. And then afterwards they go, dude, that's awesome. My wife's so happy. She's, she's comfortable now. She, she's not asking me all these questions or giving me these looks like, you know, what's really going on. So just an idea. This is one of my, I, I you know, I think one of my best ideas, um, I had a client who's a friend, he, uh, he him and I, um, he's 60. I worked with him prior to retirement and he had just retired. Um, 
And in working with him, I thought I knew him really well. We'd go out and we'd have a beer, and I knew his family really well, and he knew mine. And one day we're out and we're having a drink uh, after work one day, and he said, I asked him just in, you know, incidentally, how are you doing? And he goes, and this was his comment, I'm better, I'm better now. What do you mean? What was wrong? Oh, I was really messed up. I'm like, no, you weren't. I've been talking to you. What? what? No, I'm really, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm better now, but it was a bad, it was bad. I'm like, what was bad? So, so I'm 43, okay? I have a wife and, uh, and two kids, 11 and 13. And, and I'm in that station of life where I had tunnel vision as a financial planner. I'll tell you, I mean, I, I was looking at it as withdrawal rates, you know, alpha, beta, risk tolerance, uh, uh, longevity, Th those were really kind of where I was thinking on a financial plan. Nothing really qualitatively, more quantitatively, right? And so with that bias, I never really thought through the retirement from, from a retiree's perspective. Again, I'm 43, I'm naive to that. And so he shares with me that he, um, he retired and all of a sudden no one called him. He had millions, but nobody called him. He was important. He, he, he ran a company, he, had, he, he was paid well, he had a lot of pride for what he did, and he didn't realize that, you know, after 30 days it was great because it was kind of like a vacation, but after that, reality set in, caused friction with him and his wife. He was sleeping in another room. He didn't, he woke up at nights crying, he didn't know why. And what he told me was, he goes, I wish somebody would have told me it was coming. He went to see a counselor and the counselor kind of figured him out and and from there when he was sharing all this with me which was really awesome that he shared it with me i started thinking i'm like wow i bet steve's not alone here i bet i bet there's others and sure enough i started asking my clients who i'm a little bit more comfortable with asking such questions and they all said the same thing in some way shape or form it hit them and then i started thinking this has got to be fixed and so what I did is I created uh, what we call retirement support group. And the idea is this is, you know, we have guys who are just pre and just post retirement. Uh, we get together quarterly and there's usually a 20 or 30 minute kind of educational piece to it where we'll talk about, I don't know, what's going on in the markets, how elections, the last one was how elections affect markets. Um, but it's very light, right? Financial planning light. And then we'll have a qualitative speaker about somebody doing community work. You know, the last one was a guy in our church um, um, feeding souls, as he says, um, and what he's doing for all these guys and how he gets retirees and he gives them purpose, you know, by having them help on, on people's homes. Because being a man, even though I'm not retired, I can tell you this, we just want to be told what to do. Really? I mean, give me a project. I'm not going to go find a project, but if somebody were to call me and say, hey, somebody needs help, will you help today? I will. And most men are like that. I believe that. And so this men's group is really cool where we have, again, uh, kind of a quantitative part of it, a qualitative part, which is some sort of speaker. Uh, Steve, the guy I just referenced, he spoke at one of them and told him about his, his experience. And then at the end, we have white noise. It's usually over March Madness, you know, where they can just talk and interact because that's the purpose of the group is that they can talk amongst themselves. Where you have guys who have already retired, been there, done that, talking to guys who haven't. So for me, it's worked awesome. Awesome. Now, my, living in California, um, it's going to sound cliche, but my wife and my kids have celiac disease, so we're gluten-free. I don't. I get my gluten on the outside. But <laughs> you, I had gluten last night, actually. So, uh, um, you know, gluten, celiac means you can't really eat anything. It is a healthy lifestyle. And so what we started to do is let's let's... Let's create some healthy, you know, events. And so what we did is we created healthy cooking classes where people learned how to cook gluten-free or just, you know, in a very healthy way. And it, what we noticed was, and this is done in restaurants and in showrooms, like TV type, um, you know, when you watch the, um, uh, the cooking channel, it's like those kind of studios, those kind of places. And what happens is there's, we bring in top chefs and they make these whole meals and everybody gets to eat the meal and learn and husbands and wives get to cook together. It's a bonding experience and it's awesome. But what I realized was I want them fiscally fit. That's me as a financial planner. I want them physically fit too. I mean, retirement's going to be a long time, hopefully. 
So let's enjoy it. Let's put ourselves in the best physical place to make sure it's worth our while. And so we started really endorsing these things, and we do a lot of them. Um, because again, what good is retirement if you're not around to enjoy it, right? Uh, that's our last invitation. So we did a holiday one as well. On top of celiac, on top of California, my wife's a yoga and Pilates instructor, so continue the stereotype. Um, but then I was thinking to myself, wow, she could really help some of my clients. And so what we do now is we actually have classes for our clients. In January and in June is typically when we start a new series because in January everybody has the New Year's resolution and in June everybody wants to get ready for summer. And so what we do is we do a series of yoga and Pilates classes. She does them for me. She teaches our clients. We put our, our little logos on everything. We put them on yoga mats and bottles and towels and stuff like that. But really, the clients enjoy it. It's for a variety, beginning yoga to, to really, you know, people who are really good at yoga. I won't say experts. Um, and Pilates, you know, I took her class. I thought I was in shape. I'm not in shape. Um, um, but what I noticed was... Through all of this, you're, you're sweating with your client, you're eating with your client, you're drinking with your client, you're playing with your client. Who's going to take your client? They're your friend. And I was telling somebody in the lobby earlier too, ironically, we spend so much time with our clients who all bring prospects to all of these events. They're always open for guests. And here's what happens. It's, it's like going to a party that you don't know anybody, but the party is so fun that you immediately have fun because it's contagious. These aren't bad, you know, Avon type events. These are good, well-run, fun things. So with that, we get to know our clients better. But what I was sharing in the lobby was, I don't even do reviews hardly anymore. Our clients will call, or, our, or my assistant will call for our clients to come in. Hey, it's been a couple months. You know, since you've talked to Joe about your stuff. Oh, I just saw Joe at the wine tasting. As long as he thinks it's fine, I'm fine. Now, that doesn't mean don't do your due diligence and take care of your clients' accounts, but it's funny how much time it's freed me up. So I've shared a lot of with, with you, and uh, you, some of you may think, well, gosh, Joe, this sounds hard. What's my return on investment? How can I quantify my marketing dollars? Because it sounds expensive too, and it is. I don't know how to answer that for you, but I can just tell you, top of the table in two years. I just am three-fourths there this year. And I've never had more fun. I love going to work every day. It, my clients love it. Everybody's healthy, happy, and it's this synergistic client base that you just can't is never get taken away from you. So I hope some of this helps you, but I know you're sitting here looking at my invitations and maybe hearing my stories, but what I thought was, well, heck, how can I show them? And so what we did was we created a video that I want to share with you that kind of lets you experience the experience. Oh, before that, I almost forgot, sorry. One last thing I think is vital. You should all consider this. Uh, we started a business advisory council. All right? A business advisory council. It's not a board of directors because they don't make decisions, but it is a group of clients and non-clients. We meet quarterly. And what we do is um, we discuss kind of some of the marketing ideas we want to we, we wanna come up with. I show them resumes of people I'm considering hiring. We talk about how we can be more engaged in the community. And, and they help us message, right? And from these events, from that group of people, here's what ends up happening. I have, um, next month I'm flying in a client's plane. He flies me now once a year or twice a year to go golf to meet his friends. I have another client who I didn't even know this. He put it on this tagline of his email. Hey, if you're going to retire, call Joe Travato. I didn't even know he put it there. My assistant brings in an email, printed it out, and shows me. And she goes, did you tell Jimmy to put this on his email? I go, I, I would never do that. And I called Jimmy, and I said, hey, why'd you put this on your email? And he goes, when you find a good thing, you want to share it. We have another client who sets up eight dinners for us a year to meet the retirees of a local, uh, a local branch of a global oil company. 
He doesn't do anything except call me and tell me what date and where to be, what hotel to be at and pay for it. These are the results. Back to business advisory council, why clients and non-clients? Don't you want to know what your competitors are thinking and what they're sharing? Don't you want to message to the people you're not working with and figure out what they want to hear and not make it the exclusive club? So with that, got us some national recognition from Bob Varis of Financial Planning Magazine. He wrote a really nice piece, which kind of led to us being able to share with you today. Um, but with that, I, I, I just wanted to thank you and for listening to me rant about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And I hope you guys get to enjoy some of it. But for now, please enjoy our video. Another turning point, a fork stuck in the road Time grabs you by the wrist, directs you where to go So make the best of this test and don't ask why It's not a question but a lesson learned in time It's something unpredictable, but in the end is right I hope you had the time of your life Take the photographs and still frames in your mind Hanging on a shelf in good health and good time Tattoos and memories and dead skin on trial For what it's worth, it was worth all the while It's something unpredictable, but in the end is right I hope you had the time Thank you.